Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, give yourselves a hand this morning. Uh, today is the, uh, the trifecta for a preacher. Spring break, spring forward, spring rain. All right. Great, great morning today to worship. So glad you braved it. And uh, welcome those who are joining us online as well. Uh, just before I get started, uh, three years ago, around this time, there was uh, about 21 of us who went on a trip to Israel. And uh, there's a guy who led it by the name of Dr. David Crutchley. He is a uh, professor of religion at Carson Newman University. And so we were able to get him. He's going to come to our church for three weeks leading up to Easter to talk about specific Holy Land sites and how they are uh, help deepen our understanding on our road to, to Easter and particularly to the cross. So I just want to encourage you to, to be there. He has a, uh, uh, a very sharp wit. He's able to make things simple, and he also is South African, so he has a cool accent. So I know you'll really appreciate that. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather around your word and to grow in our faith. Help us, Lord, to be honest with uh, where we are in our lives right now, and we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I love when kids pray. Kids, when they pray, have simple, honest, get-to-the-heart-of-it kind of prayers. And I came across a couple kids' prayers I want you to see. Let's look at this first one. Dear God, would you make me a little brother... I want somebody to boss around. <laughs> Amen. Or take this one from um, Sam. I want to be just like my daddy when I get big, but not with so much hair all over. <laughs> this one is really kind of cool. Uh, Dear God, I think about you sometimes even when I'm not praying. I like that. And this one has a little bit of a different take. Dear God... Instead of letting people die and having to make new ones, why don't you just keep the ones you got now? <laughs> that, there's a message in that prayer, is there not? The message is, is about death, right? And about why does this happen? There are times in life when things all go well, and there are times in life when it's difficult or disappointing. We're in this series, God on Mute, talking about the disappointment of unanswered prayer. And particularly when we pray, why, in some cases, do we not seem to have the answers that we're looking for? Have you ever had a time in your life where you're wrestling with, how am I going to get through this? How am I going to get through this? I remember, uh, I thought about this this week, I've forgotten about this, maybe I blocked this story out. But I was about 19 years old. I had my little Volkswagen Rabbit, 1980 yellow Volkswagen Rabbit, and I lived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. was going to go up to visit uh, a friend of mine about three hours north. And I was a new driver. I had only gotten my uh, license just a few, maybe a month or two before. And I remember getting on, it was, I hadn't had much experience with the expressway. And I remember getting on the highway, and if you know anything about Philadelphia, there's, there's a large river, and on one side is New Jersey, and the other side is Pennsylvania. And I was going north to Bloomsburg. And I remember I was, I was driving. I was on this big highway. Next thing I know, I was going over the river into New Jersey. And I was supposed to go north. And I thought to myself, how am I going to get up there? And then I finally got back on the route. And I found, finally found my way up, going up north. And then as I was driving up there, it had gotten dark by that point. And I was driving on uh, I-80 going across um, Pennsylvania. And then my car, which could max out at like 60 miles an hour, because it had like four speeds, right? And I remember my car was all of a sudden sound like a tank. <laughs> it was like this loud noise. It turns out the, the tailpipe separated from the catalytic converter. I was going 55 degree, uh, miles an hour. On the highway, I didn't know where I was. There was before smartphones. And I remember pulling off on a highway. It was dark lit, and I remember looking down the road, and there was this little gas station. It's like 1030 at night, and I remember driving down there, and I think, what is wrong with my car? And I don't know anything with my car. Fortunately, there was a guy there to help me, and 
get some string and tie my tailpipe up to my door so I could continue to drive, and I still had to drive like another 45 minutes, I just thought to myself, how am I going to get through this? Have you had a time in your life when you said, how am I going to get through this? Maybe it's a diagnosis that you received, or maybe it's a phone call that you received, or you got a pink slip, or you saw your bank account statement, and you just think, how am I actually going to get through this? That's what we're going to talk about today. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, and we're going to look at an account from Jesus' life, uh, really during the last few hours of Jesus' life. And as always, you can access the sermon notes on the YouVersion app. Uh, this is what we traditionally call Maundy Thursday. This is the last night of Jesus' life where we celebrate the Lord's Supper, where uh, we remember Jesus went to Gethsemane to pray, where he was betrayed by uh, Judas and denied by Peter, all within a few amount of hours. And this is very appropriate for us. If you feel like you're overwhelmed, this will help us. This is a picture of the Garden of Gethsemane. If you haven't seen it, you can see it in Israel. In fact, some of these trees are, they estimate roughly about 900 years old. Think about that, 900 years old. It literally means place of pressure or oil press. It's literally a place that Jesus came regularly to pray, and it's a very appropriate place because Jesus was literally being crushed at this time. He wasn't just suffering, he was being crushed. He's being crushed psychologically. He was deeply distressed. It says a little bit later, we'll look at, my soul is overwhelmed. He was being crushed emotionally. Jesus knew that uh, Judas was going to betray him. He knew that all of his disciples were going to leave him behind. Nonetheless, he is feeling crushed emotionally. He's feeling crushed spiritually. He realizes all the sins of humanity, past, present, and future are all going to be laid on him in a few hours. Could you imagine that? And he's also being crushed physically. Luke 22 tells um, an account where Jesus prayed and his, his, his blood was, uh, his sweat was like drops of blood, which is literally something that can happen when little capillaries, when you're under so much stress and pressure, they burst and it seems like you're bleeding. Jesus is being crushed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He feels abandoned. Have you ever felt that way? Abandoned? Maybe you've been betrayed by a close friend or somebody that you trusted. Or you have a chronic pain that doesn't seem to get any better. Or you just feel abandoned by God. That he didn't answer the pr your prayers. What do we do when we feel crushed? I want to look at these couple verses in Mark chapter 14 about what to do when you feel overwhelmed, when you feel crushed. First thing, as we look at this uh, account of Jesus' life, it's important for us, when we feel crushed, to find your people. To find your people. Let's look at verse 32. It says, They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. By the way, Jesus most likely went to this occasion on multiple, uh, multiple times. It wasn't just once. It was multiple times because he regularly went there to pray. He tells his disciples to pray, but then he says in verse 33, he took Peter, James, and John along with him. Why did Jesus take those three people, Peter, James, and John? Think about that. If you look at the life of Jesus, he had different relationships with different groups of people. He had, if you look at like the feeding of the 5,000, they were there primarily for free food and miracles. The next group of people was roughly 70 or 72 people who he had commissioned, like a larger group of people who followed Jesus, who he commissioned to go out into different towns and cities. And then he had the ones that we're familiar with, the, ten, or the 12 apostles, right? The, his, his main people. But then he had these three, Peter, James, and John. And when you look at the, the accounts of Scripture, you see on a couple of times when he, uh, he prays, he goes to the Mount of Transfiguration, he prays for somebody to get healed. It seems like he takes them, just these three guys. 
And he, in a sense, is even more transparent with these three people than he is with anybody else. He knows who his people are, those closest to him. Do you have people in your life like that? Two or three close people that you can go to when you're overwhelmed? I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I'm overwhelmed, I have a temptation to isolate, to kind of avoid being around people. And I try to, I'm an internal processor. I try to figure out things myself. But it's important for us to find some other people to talk to so that we're not alone. For me, I certainly talk to my wife, and if you're married, it's a good idea to talk to your spouse. I meet with a counselor once a month because it's important for me to do that, just to make sure I'm psychologically healthy. And I have some other people in my life that I call or I see or I get together with that help me when I feel overwhelmed. Do you have people like that in your life that you can reach out to? Many of us don't. But if you're going to get through difficult times in your life when you feel overwhelmed, you have to find some people. Some people. You've got to find your people. Second thing I want to encourage us to do, that as I read the scripture, is to uh, admit your weaknesses. Admit your weaknesses. Let's look at that verse 33 again. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. In other words, Jesus is being vulnerable here. He didn't do that with the, uh, everybody or the twelve. He did it with these three, deeply distressed. And notice what he says in verse 34. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. Jesus chose to be vulnerable. He didn't choose to be vulnerable to everybody. He didn't even choose to be as vulnerable with the 12. He chose to be vulnerable with the three. He admitted he needed help. Facebook friends are not the ones that you want to be transparent with with everything in your life. You can overshare. Find a few that you can be vulnerable with. This past uh, weekend, I, I, we have Apple TV, and I, I came across a, TV, a show called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the House. Some of you may have read that book, and I watched this animated short. It's up for an Oscar. It's brilliant. It's like watching art. And I found this little quote as I was uh, researching this. And I'll show you a picture here. It's about this interaction of this boy. He's trying to find home. And he talks to the horse and he says, When have you, um, sorry, when have you been at your strongest? And the horse says, When I have dared to show my weakness. We want to hide our weaknesses, but it's most helpful if we show our weaknesses, especially to those who are close to us that we trust. Paul did this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We see that Paul had this thorn that he begged that, uh, Jesus, would you please take this thorn away? And it didn't happen. But he says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. He says, each time, he said, speaking of Jesus, my grace is all that you need. My power works best in weakness. And then he says a little bit later, for when I am weak, then I am strong. It's difficult to admit that you need help and that you're weak. But that's when you're strongest. Do it with some others that you trust. Jesus admitted his weakness. Paul did. And so can we. So find your people. Admit your weakness. And lastly, tell God. Tell God or pray. Notice what it says in verse 35. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if it would be possible that the hour might pass from him. Do you think there's any significance to him falling and praying as opposed to standing up? Why did he fall down and pray? Was it a sign of respect? Was it a sign of his desperation? I think it was 
God, I need you. And notice the first word he says in verse 36. Abba, Father. That's that word for daddy. Daddy, help me. If you've ever had a child, and your child has ever called out to you as a parent, help me. That's the best kind of ask that you would ever want as a parent. And Jesus knows his father. He doesn't call him the man upstairs or Yahweh. He calls him daddy. This is difficult. And he asks him something very specific. Take this cup from me. Jesus gave his worries to God. 1 Peter 5, 7 reminds us, Give all of your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Your friends, while they are well-meaning, and even the ones that you trust, some of your friends will just be insufficient for you. They won't fill the things that you need. Only God can. In fact, sometimes in life, only a word from God can give you what you need. Your friends can't do it. Wise counsel won't do it. It has to be from God. You ever wonder to yourself, why should I even pray if God knows everything? I mean, if God knows everything, why, should he, why do I even need to express any words? The reason that you need to pray, or we're invited to pray, it's true, God knows everything. But when we pray, when we articulate the words and the feelings in our heart, it helps us to have a better awareness of what's going on internally. So when we pray to God, part of the gift of prayer is helping you process what you are feeling and experiencing back to God. It's helping you. It's not just about giving a request to God. In the uh, God on Mute Unanswered Prayer course, there's a story of a guy that I want to make sure you hear about. His name is Simon Thomas. I want to show you a picture of him. Uh, he had a great life. This is his wife, Gemma, and their son. And uh, he was a football commentator in uh, the UK. And uh, in the fall of 2017, his life was going great. Uh, he had a good job. He had a good family. He loved his son. And then he started getting anxiety attacks. He never faced that in his life. He just started feeling anxious, so much so that he couldn't get up in the morning. He couldn't go to work. He got depressed. In fact, it was just a really difficult time. And then the hardest part hit. Gemma, his wife, began to have headaches out of the blue. And then the headaches got worse. She felt sick. And then one weekend, she couldn't get up out of bed. And so they called and took her to the hospital. And when they got to the hospital, she was diagnosed with an aggressive form of leukemia, of cancer. And three days later, she died. Could you imagine being him, a single dad, going back to the hospital to get the death certificate a few days later when your wife seemed like everything was fine. He struggled. How am I going to get through this? If you watch it, you'll, you'll hear what he says, but basically he said uh, in the interview, when I was um, away uh, at my house, um, I would go outside and he said, I had very gracious neighbors because I prayed very loudly during that time. It wasn't just a help me God prayer. It was a this God prayer. Where are you, God? Why would you allow this to happen to me? How am I going to get through this? How am I going to get my son through this? The good news of the gospel if you've ever felt that, is that we are not alone. That God chooses to enter into our suffering. 
That's one of the things that makes Christianity unique compared to all the world religions is that God chooses to become one of us and to suffer. If you may be familiar with this verse, Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Jesus died not only for our sins, but he died for our sorrows. Hebrews chapter 4 goes on to say this. This high priest, speaking of Jesus, of ours, understands our weakness. For he, <clears throat> for he faced all the same testings that we do, yet did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, and there we will receive his mercy. And we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. Jesus suffers with us. For some of you, that's the word that you need to hear today. That you're not alone. Jesus suffers with you. I just thought of this uh, today, just this minute. I remember having a conversation with a, a person who was being betrayed by her workplace. And I remember talking to her just before a big meeting was going to happen. And it was going to be publicly, potentially humiliating for her. And I remember her talking to her and her expressing how she felt all alone. And I just reminded her in that little brief encounter, you are not alone. Somebody else knows what it's like to suffer have people say things about you. Jesus was with her, and Jesus suffers with us. So how do we make it through these difficult times in our life? <clears throat> we find our people. We admit our weakness. We're vulnerable with others, and we tell God how we feel. Lindsay, you mind coming up at this time, wherever you are? I'm going to ask you to do something. At the end of this prayer course, uh, they did an exercise, which I thought might be helpful for some of us today. So I'd like you to take your hands out and clench your fists. Could you do that for me? And I want you just to look at your fists right now. Just look at your fists, nothing else. I want you, as you look at your fist, to identify one or two really significant struggles that you're facing right now. Don't know what it might be, but you know what it is. One or two really difficult struggles. And I want you to focus those on your hands, as these are your struggles. And now I want you to simply relax your fists and open up your hands to God. And lift these great struggles up to the Lord. Offer up your pain, your frustration, your disappointment to Him. I want to pray for us. Lord, this morning, we ask that you would help us to surrender our pain, our disappointments, even our questions to you. I ask you to take the things that are crushing us and turn them into something beautiful. Help us, each of us, to know that you are with us, that you're going to get us through these things. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, the one who is, the one who will come but also the one who chose to suffer with us. Amen.